Hello and welcome to the exhibition Kazuo Ishiraga, Tales of the Water Margin. I'm delighted to be able to introduce two visionary curators and art writers for our discussion, Paul Schimmel and Alan Schwartzman. First of all, let me introduce Paul, who was chief curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles from 1990 until 2012. While Paul is synonymous with the Los Angeles art scene, having curated both Helter Skelter in 1992 and Under the Big Black Sun in 2011, as well as solo exhibitions of artists like Charles Ray and Laura Owens, he has also worked extensively on the global artistic zeitgeist of the 1950s and 60s. Paul was amongst the very first curators to acknowledge the importance of the post-war Japanese avant-garde. Most prominently in the exhibitions Out of Actions in 1998 and Destroy the Picture Painting the Void in 2012. Paul is also one of the earliest and most passionate Western advocates for the work of Kazuo Shiraga, whom he got to know personally during the 1990s. Alan is an independent curator and art advisor who has helped build some of the greatest public and private art collections in the last 30 plus years. Amongst his roles, he is the creative director of the Institute of Inhotim in Brazil and also curator of the Ruchowski Collection in Dallas. Most recently, Alan was chairman of the Fine Arts Division at Sotheby's from 2016 to 2020. Alan first encountered the work of Shiraga in the mid-1990s, and he has successfully integrated many works by Shiraga and other members of the post-war Japanese avant-garde into major collections worldwide. A case in point is the collection of Howard and Cindy Ruchowski in Dallas, which has the finest collection of Gutai work outside of Japan. So this is going to be a lively discussion. And before beginning, I'd like to say a few words about the 27 works in this exhibition and the Chinese literary classic, The Water Margin, or Suikoden, as it's known in Japanese. Tales of the Water Margin was written in the 14th century and tells of the exploits of 108 outlaws during the Song Dynasty. It is one of the four great classical novels in Chinese literature, and it is a beloved text. Kazuo Ishiraga received an illustrated edition of the Suikoden from his father as a child, and it sparked a lifelong interest in Chinese culture. Now, as international appreciation of Ishiraga grew in the late 1950s, he began to title his foot paintings after the 36 heavenly spirits and 72 earthly demons from the book. Now, Ishiraga was not the first Japanese artist to refer to the Chinese classic, with both Hokusai and Kuniyoshi producing woodblock prints to illustrate the tale during the Edo period. And we'll be referring to the Kuniyoshi images throughout this discussion. But a debate has persisted about how we should think about Shiraga's use of these titles. Shiraga himself proposed the idea that the titling was merely to help in the identification of one work from another, where others have sought to read more into this titling. Let me quote Chiraga here. He said, Please, everybody, don't think too much about these titles. It is all by instinct. I would look at the list of heroes and then would come up with ideas like, This painting has lines that resemble running or throwing, so let's title it Otsusen Chiyusei, which is the nickname of a hero who was good at throwing stones like a baseball pitcher. And before handing over to Paul and Alan, let me introduce the three paintings that we have on front of us. On the left is Chiyusei Byo Chu from 1962. In the middle, Tensho Sei Botsusen from 1960, which is on loan from the Ruchowski Collection in Dallas. And on the right is Ni, in parentheses, Tenko Sei Roshi from 1962, which is from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. Paul and Alan, what are we to make of all of this? You want to start, Paul? Shall I start? Yes, please. Um, so, so I, I, I find the whole idea of this exhibition to be um, both a compelling package of how to put together a tight grouping of Chiraga works that follow a line of thought that comes from the artist, while at the same time, I find it very confounding. So. Um, and, and for two principal reasons, and I'm sure there are more reasons than that. Um, the first is that you have said that, um, that the titling was almost a kind of both a technical process of how he could distinguish from paintings when he was sending them off for exhibition and perhaps sale, uh, and also a, um, a kind of game that he played with himself where 
after he completed the works, he, he, he found um, parallels between these characters that he had, uh, whose stories he had become engaged with since he was a child, uh, and the paintings themselves. Um, so I, the first thing that occurs to me is, I question whether we really buy this idea that on the one hand, it was a practical solution and that, um, and that he, by his own statement, um, he did not intend for people to be reading narrative or meaning into them that relates the title to the work. Do we fully buy that these are non-narrative paintings? Um, there is, I mean, I guess I would just propose this in, in one particular way, which is in thinking about the artists of Gutai, particularly in the first generation, where the movement was very much about making something that had never been made before. In Chiraga, you find a real uh, consistency in, in his process and what he seeks to do. And in fact, over many decades, his, his movement changes just as one's movement through time changes, his approach to the gesture of the body changes as his spirituality evolves. Um, but really the paintings are, are, are very consistent in a, in a kind of more formal European and American sense in their, in their span across many decades. I would say that the thing that changes the most perhaps over the decades is the palette rather than and the technique, the process, and the gesturality. And so I, I'd love some more to hear your thoughts on, um, on whether we buy that these are, that, that the titles are really just a, um, uh, independent of the works pretty much, and that these are, um, are these indeed pure abstractions? Or is there some narrative thread going through the artist's mind while he's making them? I think for a number of abstract painters of the 50s, this, uh, there was always a kind of pressure uh, how to represent a work, whether it was untitled, called untitled, untitled given a number, a letter, or whether certain key works were given names. Uh, Sometimes they were based on uh, 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 characters from uh, literature. Um, you know, Joan Mitchell would do that. Uh, uh, Norman Bloom would do that. Other artists would uh, gravitate towards a more kind of abstracted and numerical system. Uh, uh, and I imagine as the work began to become visible, in places other than for like almost display purposes in Japan as process oriented as, as they became in a sense works of art entering into a, into the art world um, there was that uh, need uh, to differentiate and and, and certainly it, it seems from what I've read um, it, it it wasn't something provided uniformly across the board at the time. Uh, there was certainly some encouragement, as I've seen again and again, if an artist leaves a work untitled, uh, collectors start making up names. <laughs> and, and sometimes those names kind of stick. So, you know, it was a way of kind of br bringing the sheep home by, by renaming them. And yet, the choice of the water margin heroes certainly is a profound insight into who Shiraga is. Uh, firstly, um, a reverence for the badass motherfuckers. I mean, these are heroes that are uh, out, outlaws. Uh, they're bandits. Um, they uh, uh, deal with, in a sense, brutality and cruelty and an intensity that Shiraga felt lacked in Japan. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of humble Japanese-ness was something that was not nearly as inspiring as going to these outlaws 
in the land China <clears throat> where his culture, Japanese culture, had come from. And it is interesting that it, the two relative, two scales, uh, were uh, focused on the celestial being the larger and the earthly being the smaller. Interesting. The, the, the smaller being the body. Chiraga himself, the celestial, that almost kind of religious monk-like ambition that he brought more specifically to his work uh, uh, later on. The story of the water margin, it's about betrayal. It's about the individual versus the state, the outlaw ultimately joining forces with the government and being betrayed about it. These are not uncommon feelings that artists have in terms of both their own identity and where they're going with their own work. So it's a way of kind of pushing back against the man, whoever that may be. And it is interesting that his first use of the water margin, preceded by several years, uh, were in two sculptural works, two of the most important works, and in some ways more illustrational. Certainly in the chopping of the log comes directly out of the water margin, but also the kind of viscous marshland of rolling in the mud and the collective enterprise of these heroes, in a sense, coming out of this primordial brew is something he referred to as gutai. So it, it, it is in many ways really a profound insight and it is, I think, to a large degree completely arbitrary as to what is called what, other than maybe in the broadest sense, the celestial versus the earthly. I, I just wanted to uh, share an observation of the paintings in this room. What, what I see again and again in the paintings in this room is a kind of epic relationship between the artist and the canvas. Um, and with his paint, there's a, th th these are, these are dense, um, all over compositions that nonetheless have a great richness in how color begins to define form and space. And even while white space becomes critical to all of them, um, Th th there's still this sense of a battle to me in these. I can't help but think of 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 um, of battle when I look at them. And I love this this notion that the the kind of uh, the way in which the artist is painting these, hanging from a um, a support made of a tree, and actually painting with his feet. Um, that 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 there's a there's something that that takes the kind of beautiful flow of lyricism and places it within the intense energy of um, of what could be either uh, battle or let's say the most intense kind of celestial um, freedom, kind of like a like a star exploding. Um, Epic is the word I keep returning to with these paintings. I, I think that epic and really a battle, which of course is what the water margins was about, um, was, was a, um, a, a metaphor for fighting with painting too. Yeah. And he was in a sense part of a, a rather international confluence, but something rather uniquely Shiraga in terms of that notion of one fights a painting, yep. one conquers this two-dimensional plane 
when I had the opportunity to visit him in the mid nineties in his uh, studio, um, we talked about, there are a few exceptionally large works, why he didn't pursue that more. And very matter of factly, the, the, the scale of these larger works was as much as he was able to accomplish from a single point and given the very diminutive diameter of his studio. M meaning, if you sat as I did in the studio with him, um, with his uh, timbers going up high in a single rope, you realize the largest works essentially went from wall to wall. And he, he could, uh, they are always from the center because I think much less in a way swinging as he was using the rope as a support in which to be able to traverse the entire landscape that he was creating with his body uh, below him. And the larger sky size, I think represented in a way uh, almost the extreme of kind of uncontrollability and the smaller size represented a kind of control scale that he was able to be more, in a way, uh, specifically kind of pictographic mm -hmm. um, or uh, uh, imagist in the most kind of uh, cave-like, primordial sort of way. I like this language that you're using because especially the large paintings, so many of them feel like he could have, he could so easily have gone one step too far. He could have lost the painting. And, um, and it's that kind of tension of how much to do and how much to put into it that I think ultimately um, defines the greatness in each individual work. Alan, let me stop you there to introduce a further group of paintings. From the left, we have Chikatsusei Maun Kinshi from 1960, which is on loan from the Art Institute of Chicago. Next is Chiyosei Mochakuten from 1960 also. Next to that is Tenisei Seki Hatsuki from 1959, which is a part of the Yamamura collection at the Hyoga Prefectural Museum of Art. And then we have Tenpaisei Soshiko from 1960. When one looks particularly at the, the paintings that go to near black, some of my favorites, they're not, they're not the most seductive, um, but in a way to me they are. Um, because it, it really is this sense of, of, of the immeasurable depths. Um, these seem to me to be the most intense where he's, he's really facing up against the, the, the kind of, um, the battle of existence and of life. I, um, I mean, this could have been mud so easily. It's so interesting because at times he referred to red, this crimson lake red, it, it was like his favorite color. And I, and I asked him specifically about the meaning of it. And I said, but you've, it's also been referenced to your interest in, in blood and the body and there, were a, a, there was a temple that had a, a blood ceiling. And he, he then subsequently did refer to it. Yes, yes, of course, red is, 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 is in a sense the body. And black, and this, it is certainly something uh, uh, I had an opportunity to talk about, and he's also spoken of it, um, is this void, and it is a void that is a, a, an existential theme that runs both through American, European, and uh, Japanese art in the mid 50s. It is, it is, an, it, it is a, 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 a sense of uh, both uh, 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 not being able to penetrate, and also like, like the mud is, from which things come out of, out of that darkness, something, and he, he has referred to it as, you know, in a general sense, his battle between red and black. And in the same sense of battling with 
pictorial space. He's, he's battling with both the body and the void. I know this painting. Where is this painting from? This is a Tainanse Seimenju from 1960. And it's one of the eight paintings in this exhibition that are on loan from the Hyoko Prefectural Museum of Art. I, I would like to also say that um, I've seen, I've been fortunate enough to see a lot of these paintings. Um, was able to visit the, the uh, storage space of, of Hyoko Prefectural Museum, which I was told was tougher to get into than Fort Knox. And we, we got to like pull the paintings off the, the sliders and see all of these works. And I will say that more than any other painter I can think of, my notion of what a charaga will feel like as an experience and what it looks like in a reproduction are very, very different. Often my expectation of what the work is or how one experiences it is totally different when I'm in the presence of them. Um, what I, and, and so some of these paintings have um, the paint, whether they, they involve many colors or a few colors, the paint kind of merges into form and composition. And then in others, you get, you very much get this sense of the foot and of the, the, the toes as scraping through the paint and defining the form and, and, and how, how the body remains present in these works, in these very essentially non-figurative works, even though we may associate some bodily forms with some of the elements of them. I, um, I find more and more impressive as I'm seeing so many of them together. In some instances, the paint where you can see the use of the toe is relatively flat and translucent. And then in others, it's so sculptural. It's, it's almost uh, um, relief more than, um, than pure painting. Uh, I mean, they are particularly, um, they have a physicality that um, was not part of the, the language of the first generation. And, and, and in some ways, the, the, the younger generation uh, became more engaged, whether, you know, if it was somebody like Al Held with, you know, using almost a heavy impasto. Uh, um, the, the, but you are, it, it really, uh, uh, Alan, you're, you're so right. That there is a, 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 a sense of its presence and its making that you feel when you see it in person that an illustration doesn't, really fully capture. It's not just the dimensionality of the, the impasto. And mind you, he, he at you know, one point early in his development, it, it, it was a move from his fingers to his hand to using his arm. Uh, and then two years later, uh, kind of finally the feet. And, 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 and yet there was this uh, impressive heritage in his work of, uh, calligraphy and you know not wanting to paint with the right digits was a way of getting away from that kind of illustrational sense but one sense calligraphy it, even in his feet and him battling between it it being in a sense lyric abstraction versus this much more gestural and a kind of brutal gestural abstraction they are closer to a kind of haiku mm -hmm. that they the, the period of time other painters who were working on the floor um, was relatively uh, truncated and certainly compared to the way a Pollock worked um, which is still in a way painting uh, and over an extended period of time of building up the surface his very best works were often made uh, in 45 minutes. And, and in a sense, he felt he was, sometimes had to go back and, 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 and rework it only if he lost it going, in a sense, beyond that kind of explosive and compressed and highly um, performative nature of, of, his, of his process. 
And it's exactly this performative nature that keeps um, coming back again and again in looking at these works together. And it's what oddly for me connects him more to a next generation of American artists working with their body, whether it's directly in the realm of performance and, and, um, and dance and the stage or, um, or in the works of artists like uh, Bruce Nauman and Richard Serra, who very early on are um, utilizing either their own bodies as a medium or, or the, um, the force of what comes from their body or can be physically measured through their body um, uh, to, to create a new language for, for art. I see these, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's the first time that I'm recognizing really just how fundamentally different this would be from the anthropometries of Eve Klein, for example, which, which are also using the body as, um, as, as a, a vehicle for, um, for paint. But I, I mean, I, the, the Kleins are obviously more illustrational in that respect mm -hmm. and uh, 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 are not, um, I think, finally conceivable without the direct knowledge that Eve Klein had of Shiraga. And what Shiraga was doing uh, was well known. Uh, Klein had certainly been in Japan on two occasions, ex extended occasions. He was one of the first real advocates. And I think it, 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 in, in this first generation after Shiraga, uh, that includes Alan Capro, where there was an absolute acknowledgement of Shiraga's kind of primacy in terms of the connection between performance and painting. Um, I think it. I think it had immense repercussions almost immediately. Meaning, even prior to the Water Margin series, I think these more, uh, uh, in a way, transgressive works on paper. Uh, were highly influential to a generation that was emerging in the late 50s and early 60s, as the way Shiraga did in the, really the mid 50s. What I'm seeing in, in, in these smaller scale vertical paintings um, in, th in these rooms or this room um, is something that, that really is much more linked to uh, much, appears much more directly linked to calligraphy um, and, to, um, and to writing and almost to a, um, a kind of sketching of, um, of paint and space. Um, I find it interesting how in these periods, the scale, whether it's a smaller size painting or larger, that the scale of the gestures is very similar but often the, um, the effects and the experiences can be very different between the two sizes. And I guess it's also the vertical format has a very natural link to the body. Well, what I was mentioning earlier about uh, on that more intimate scale and almost kind of uh, 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 calligraphy that go, draws both upon his Asian traditions, but that almost feel like they go back to some, the ancient caves where you have uh, 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 represented representations of both uh, beast and, uh, and man in, in the most kind of uh, simple of form. Let me turn to Chi Shusei Seki Shogun from 1961 which is a heavy footprint forever registered in the middle of this canvas, and Tenmose Heikirei Kika from 1960, which is on loan from the Museum of Art in Kochi. It is interesting how on a number of works, not only where the access point is from where the rope hangs, but also compositionally he would do a circle, that there is this almost kind of Zen-like stasis at the center of a composition, a, a way of all of this, these 
these uh, gestural elements sort of flying off from the center uh, come to a kind of uh, momentary rest. Um, um, maybe it's the rest of, of, in a sense, having of completion. Let's have a look at these two works together. On the left, we have Tenyusei Hyoshito from 1961, which is on loan from the National Museum of Art in Osaka. And on the right, we've got Tenkusei Kyusen Po from 1962, which again is from Hyogo Prefectural Museum of Art. The 1961 painting is dedicated to Michel Tapier in the bottom right corner. It's written in katakana, and clearly this is an indication of the importance that Tapier had in the development of Shiraga's career. Yeah, and, and when you think about what Gallery Stadler was showing, whether it was Sam Francis or Norman Bloom or Shiraga, that was a community of this sort of, quote, younger generation uh, for which Paris became, um, oh, what did they call it? The soup <laughs> from which things, and, 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 and in many respects, I think uh, uh, Tapias did the most, and Shadler, to bring international attention. And in other respects, it, the relationship to that broader uh, world uh, made, in some ways, the radicality of the more purely performative work uh, take a second, a second stage. Paul, earlier you identified this painting, Tenyusei Daito, from 1964, from the Tochigi Prefectural Museum of Art, as a painting that you want to say something more about. I find this painting very interesting. I, and I remember you had mentioned that it was 64, and it came at the, really at the end of the series, at, at a time when he had fully, in a way, acknowledged that that it was a series, uh, um, and and this whole notion, uh, Alan and I have been talking about this sort of the battle, the depiction of the battle, um, and uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure he won the battle with this one. It's both so dense and clotted, but it seems also like a kind of uh, sort of extreme uh, way of of kind of ending the series it's 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 I, I you know i look at it and it's the it's the treachery of what happened uh when the when the hero joined uh the state and got in a way crushed by it as you were saying you're not sure if he won this battle it's, it's exactly what i was thinking it, it and unlike every other painting in this exhibition it's this is one that, that he seems very happy to leave in this um, harsh, um, unrealized, un, not fully realized state. Um, it, it, it's, it's brutal. It, it is the closest that there is in a painting all on canvas to the Borskin paintings in that sense. And it makes me think almost more of the paintings from the 50s by um, Murakami in that there, there, there wasn't um, there, there wasn't a pre uh, there wasn't an assumption about what it meant for a for a painting to be finished or satisfying or or or, or to what defines composition I mean th this is a crazy painting it's it's you could spend a lifetime trying to sort through um, where he was was in his own mind when he when he made this painting when he decided this was the point of completion it's really just like he's standing on the edge of something else that he may maybe never really gets back to but it takes him to the very edge of where he always is you know he was described and i think he liked it sort of a little bit as a beast and it made me think of uh china as the beast and this culture as a beast and uh and you 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 do battle with the boar you do battle with the beast and you can be you know crushed by it alan 
Is there one painting in the exhibition that you'd also like to comment upon? Um, I, I for, and I probably would come up with a different painting on different days of being asked this question. But for the sake of looking at another extreme, I would go back to the blacker painting um, that, that, um, that almost looks like it's got two swirling centers kind of rotating around one another. I think that this painting has such great intensity and it has that, 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 that coexistence of, of the lyrical and, and the violent at the same time. And, and, and this is exactly to me a painting that is, is a moment away from going too far. Um, and so I, I get drawn into the depths of this painting. I, in a sense, lose the sense of the overall composition because of how all of that different gesture in, in, in the blacker areas on the top surface pull me in. I mean, here I am lost in that endless intensity and motion of the body. I almost feel like when I'm looking at this painting, I begin to get a sense of where his head might have been while he was making it. And, and that, even though we can find that in, an, in a certain sense in the work of Pollock and other Americans who, who were dealing with the body and with gesture, this nonetheless is, is um, I, I don't see this having come out of any other place and any other culture than Japan in this period. And um, I, I kind of love the combination of the brutal physicality and um, this almost um, existential spirituality. I, I kind of, it sends my, and this is gonna sound wacky, but it almost sends me more toward um, an artist like Barnett Newman um, and exploring the unknown, even though its physicality is somewhat antithetical to the making of a Newman. But um, it, it, it's that sense of um, uh, this gravitational pull of the work that, that, that I find utterly compelling. Well, on that soaring note, I'd like to say what a privilege it has been to have Paul Schimmel and Alan Schwartzman with us today and to thank them for their incredible insights into this marvelous group of paintings. Thank you. I mean, this is a truly extraordinary grouping of works to see together. And, um, and, and, it, and it makes all clear how important it is for us to be looking more deeply into this artist. I mean, this is a phenomenal. Um, uh, level of achievement within a few years time and and I know that there's a similar um, uh, degree of achievement in every decade in which he worked you can't say that about too many painters of the 20th century that they were equal to great in all decades Fergus congratulations on a, a really uh, a very coherent exhibition dealing with an absolutely, uh, 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 one could say the critical period of him as a, a, a painter in terms of his themes, his working process. And it is a, uh, an absolutely uh, uh, stunning array of loans, which you have been able to uh, bring together of both among the most well-known uh, works uh, that probably as could not travel to works that have in some cases never been seen uh, before. And they have been realized in the uh, light of uh, day in your beautifully illuminated uh, virtual gallery.